welcome to our TV show, featuring documentaries, revealing the realities behind myths using scholarship and research. I'm your host, Ergun Kralukovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com and hashtag ethoside, repeat, hashtag ethoside. Meet Henry Morgenthau Sr. He was born in Mannheim, Germany in 1856, and his family immigrated to New York when he was 10 years old. He attended City College of New York, where he received a Bachelor of Arts degree and later graduated from Columbia Law School. He began his career as a lawyer, but he made his fortune in real estate. He married Josephine Sykes in 1882, and they had four children, Helen, Alma, Henry Jr., and Ruth. Morgan Howe also served as the leader of New York's Reform Jewish Community, which is a religious movement that has abandoned some traditional Jewish beliefs, laws, and practices in an effort to adapt to the ways of the modern world. This German-born American lawyer and real estate developer contributed significant sums to President Woodrow Wilson's 1912 election campaign. Morgan Howe wanted to be the chairman of Wilson's campaign finance committee, which he did not get. He also coveted a cabinet post, but that did, did not quite pan out either. Instead, Morgenthau was offered the ambassadorship to the Ottoman Empire in 1913. He was disappointed at first and didn't want to go. But after a trip to Europe and some persuading by friend Rabbi Stephen Wise, he accepted Wilson's offer. Wise explained to Morgenthau the importance of the Ottoman Empire and how Morgenthau could be more useful to the Jewish cause there than being in the United States. The two ambassadors before Morgenthau, namely Oscar Strauss and Solomon Hirsch, were also prominent Jewish Americans. President Wilson assured Morgenthau that Istanbul was where the interest of the American Jews in the welfare of Jews of Palestine was focused, which is why Wilson said he had to have a Jew in that post. Morgenthau served as the United States ambassador to the Ottoman Empire from December 11, 1913 to February 1, 1916, for a total of 26 months. What he did during that time in Istanbul, how he did it, with whom and why, are the main footings of this documentary. What you will see and hear might stun you, as you will see Morgan Howe's story is a blueprint for mass deception, systematic defamation, Islamophobia, anti-Turkism, and racism. Here is an example of his writing. I quote, the most healthy Armenian girls could be taken, converted forcibly to Mohammedanism and made the wives of concubines, wives or concubines of devout followers of the prophet. Their children would then automatically become Muslims and so strengthen the empire as the Janissaries had strengthened it formerly. These Armenian girls represent a high type of womanhood and the young Turks, in their crude, intuitive way, recognized that the mingling of their blood with the Turkish population would exert a eugenic influence upon the whole. Page 291, 291, unquote. Now, anyone who makes racist comments like these in this day and age would be immediately sued, tried, convicted, and placed behind bars. And we are talking about a U.S. ambassador here, 
not a street hoodlum. What's even more tragic and ironic is for Morgenthau, a German-born Jew, to utter concepts like eugenics and the betterment of a race through intermarriage, considering what was to come during the World War II some three decades, decades later. Then there's this, I quote, it was a complete revelation of Turkish mentality. The fact that above all considerations of race and religion, there are such things as humanity and civilization never for a moment enters the mind. They can understand a Christian fighting for a Christian and Jew fighting for a Jew, but such abstractions as justice and decency form no part of their conception of things. Page 224, unquote. We now have an excellent idea of where the good ambassador was coming from. We also can see how, why the Armenians and Greeks totally revere this man and why Armenian professors are desperate to still cling to this racist uh, series of words as the gospel truth. This book is still in use today. Politicians and newspaper editors still quote from it. School libraries still have it on shelf. One of the most racist books in America today, if not the world, is held like a reliable source of information. Let's rewind back to 1918 now. Morgenthau published his conversations with Ottoman leaders in 1918 under the title Ambassador Morgenthau's Story. Dr. Heath Laurie, a prominent professor of history who taught at Princeton University, among others, conducted a painstaking research on the claims made in Morgenthau's book and published his findings in a book called The Story Behind Ambassador Morgenthau's Story. I will quote from that book as well as from other sources in the next few minutes. Any examination of the origin of the Morgenthau story must begin with a letter, the Morgan, uh, letter Morgenthau wrote to his friend and confidant, President Woodrow Wilson on November 26, 1917. 22 months after he returned from Istanbul, that is. He stated his idea of writing a book and why he wanted to do so. He wanted to get the president's blessing for his project, which he immediately got. His sole aim was nurturing public support for the United States war effort by writing an anti-German and anti-Turkish propaganda piece, which would win a victory for the war policy of the US government. Morgenthau framed his idea to Wilson as follows. I quote, greatly discouraged at the amount of outright opposition and the tremendous indifference to the war, as well as by the lack of enthusiasm among the mass of those who are supporting the war. I'm considering writing a book in which I would lay bare not only Germany's permeation of Turkey and the Balkans, but that system as it appears in every country of the world. For in Turkey, we see the evil spirit of Germany at its worst, culminating at last in the greatest crime of all ages, the horrible massacre of helpless Armenians and Syrians. This particular detail of the story and Germany's abettance of the same, I feel positive will appeal to the mass of Americans in small towns and country districts as no other aspect of the war could, and convince them of the necessity of carrying the war to a victorious conclusion. We must win a victory for the war policy of the government, and every legitimate step or means should be utilized to accomplish it." Unquote. Within a year of this letter, the book was written, serialized in magazines, and appeared in newspapers. It was very popular. 
Morgan House's goal of contributing to America's war effort by authoring a propaganda book was achieved. Morgan House received a lucrative offer from Hollywood for the film rights of, of his book and even wrote a treatment for filmmakers. His excitement came to a screeching halt when President Wilson expressed his strong disapproval in a letter. As the Morgenthau-Wilson correspondence clearly shows, Morgenthau's book was the product of a desire to increase support for Wilson's war effort. It was intended as wartime propaganda. Against this backdrop, we must now examine how and by whom the book was written and why, and why there were so many inaccuracies, fabrications, and slander. Our sources for the book are two collections of surviving Morgenthau papers, one housed in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and the other in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. These two collections are supplemented by a wide variety of published and unpublished materials, including the papers of Burton J. Hendrick, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Morgan Howe needed the skilled writing of Hendrick to literally write Morgan Howe's book. The, to disentangle the web of questionable inputs, we must begin to evaluate the sources upon which the book was based. There is a typed transcript called Diary, which covers the actual period of Morgan Howe's assignment in Istanbul. Morgan Howe related his day's experiences to his male secretary, a Turkish Armenian named Hagop S. Andonian, who in turn typed him up. The version of events recorded in this daily diary entries frequently differs from the descriptions of the same meetings narrated in the book. Also, Morgenthau sent weekly letters to his family in the US, which were likewise written by Andonian. As Morgenthau tells us in a letter of May 11, 1915, I quote, I have really found it impossible to sit down and dictate a letter quietly. So I have instructed Andonian to take my diary and copy it with some elaborations of his own." Unquote. The book then was mostly based on the diaries and letters and sometimes supplemented by reports from Washington, D.C. and reports that he sent to Washington, D.C. Morgenthau revealed the actual author in the preface of the book. He wrote, my thanks are due to my friend, Mr. Burton J. Hendrick, for the invaluable assistance he has rendered in the preparation of this book, unquote. Morgan House story emerged from the pen of Burton J. Hendrick with the editorial assistance of numerous people, including Morgan Howe and his Armenian secretary, Andonian, who followed Morgan Howe to the US. A second key figure who had significant input in the book was Arshak K. Shimavonian, another Turkish Armenian who, in 1918, had worked as Morgan Howe's interpreter in Istanbul and accompanied him in all meetings with Turkish officials. Shimavonian's role as friend, confidant, and advisor to Morgenthau, both during and after his stay in Istanbul, is traceable in the Morgenthau papers. Morgenthau relied upon Shimavonian as Morgenthau knew neither Turkish, French, Greek, or Armenian, the four principal languages spoken in the Ottoman capital at the time. Shimavonian was a key aide to Morgenthau, both throughout his tenure in Turkey and during writing of the book in 1918. He was even entrusted by the State Department 
with the task of approving Morgenthau's manuscript. The National Archives in Washington, D.C. houses a collection of Shmavonian papers also. The written blessings of the President Wilson, coupled with the review and, and the comments on each chapter by the U.S. Secretary of State Robert Lansing, point to the endorsement of the book by the U.S. government. The fact that it is readable is entirely the work of Hendrik, the ghostwriter, who received 40% of the profits and Morgenthau the remaining 60. So what we have here is a memoir by committee. Morgenthau's Istanbul diary and family letters are reworked first by Morgenthau and Andonian, along with the ghostwriter, Hendrik, edited for content on behalf of the State Department by Shimavonian, then fine-tuned by the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, on behalf of the President, and finally written down as Ambassador Morgenthau's story by Burton Hendrick. Morgenthau's take on the disputes between Turks and Armenians are shaped to a large degree by his Armenian eyes and ears, namely Arsha K. Shimavonian and Hagop S. Andonian. The book's messages are, one, imperialistic motives led the naive young Turk government into the war by the side of Germany. Two, the young Turk leadership decided to use the cover of the war to Turkify the Ottoman Empire. Three, Henry Morgenthau was a lone voice tirelessly attempting to discourage the Talat and Enver regime from their evil scheme and four, Morgenthau's effort, efforts failed for the sole reason that the one man who could have persuaded the Turks and German uh, Turks, the German ambassador Baron Wengenheim refused to speak on behalf of the helpless Armenians. So these are the four messages. In attempting to describe the motivations compelling Talat's treatment of minorities, Morgenthau writes this, I quote, Talat explained his national policy. These different blocs in the Turkish Empire, he said, had always conspired against Turkey. Because of the hostility of these native populations, Turkey had lost province after province. Greece, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Egypt, and Tripoli. In this way, the Turkish Empire had dwindled almost to the vanishing point. If what was left of Turkey was to survive, added Talat, he must get rid of these alien people. Turkey for the Turks was now Talat's controlling idea, unquote. No reference to anything supporting Talat's alleged views on Turkey for the Turks was ever recorded by Morgenthau in either his diary or letter dealing with that meeting. Why then did Morgenthau put these words into Talat's mouth? Again, the answer is he wanted to prove that the leader of the Young Turks regime embraced a recurrent theme of Turkish nationalism, which prompted their attempt to exterminate the Armenians. This theme does not find any support in either the diary or the letters. It's pure fiction, but a useful one that the Armenians still use today. Not satisfied with relating fictitious conversations between himself and Talat, Morgenthau also at times combines events which transpired on separate occasions, thereby creating a totally inaccurate impression. Comments in the book notwithstanding, Morgenthau had not firmly concluded that the Armenians were the subject of an attempted extermination by the Young Turn leadership as late as September 1915. In addition to inventing conversations, on occasion 
Morgenthau and Henry take unsubstantiated rumor, surround it with quotation marks, and put it in Talat's mouth as well. One such example is the following passage, which reads, I quote, Talat's attitude toward the Armenians was summed up in the proud boast which he made to his friends. I have accomplished more toward solving the Armenian problem in three months than Abdul Hamid accomplished in 30 years. Once again, he has the criminal publicly boasting of his crime. How convenient. He has Talat implying that he has killed more Armenians in three months than Abdul Hamid did in 30 years. The questions beg to be asked are, who are the friends in whom Talat thus confided? confided? Which of them passed Talat's boast along to Morgenthau? Morgenthau's diary entry for July 18th, 1915, allegedly provides the answers. Gates told me Talat had said that he has accomplished more in three months about crushing the Armenians than Abdul Hamid could in 30, 33 years, unquote. About the last person one would expect to see listed among the friends of Talat Bey is Gates, the former American missionary who served as president of Robert College during Morgenthau's tenure in Istanbul. Far from Talat and Gates being friends, they were hardly acquainted as is clear from Gates' own book, not to me only. Not surprisingly, Gates mentions no such rumor in his own writings. Did no one comprehend the enormity of the injustice perpetrated by Morgan Howe's book? Well, apparently someone did. George A. Schreiner, foreign correspondent who had served in Turkey in 1915, protested the falsifications in Ambassador Morgenthau's story. Morgenthau and Schreiner saw quite a bit of each other in 1915, as the book, diary, and letter entries show. In his December 11, 1918 letter to Morgenthau, Schreiner complained about the distortions in the book in no uncertain terms. I quote, I'm writing this letter under the impression that the peace of the world will not gain by such extravagant efforts as yours. Before that can be understanding among peoples, each must have the right perspective of things, and that perspective consists of knowing the true proportions of right and wrong." Unquote. Ambassador Morgenthau attempted to make the Turks as monstrous as possible. The attorney turned real estate investor turned ambassador allowed his Armenian assistants a free reign to paint all Turks black while leaving all Armenians white. History is not black and white. Morgenthau's motives for demonizing Turks via fabrications was truly unconscionable. What kind of a man would be so bereft of morals to record such horrible lies as if they actually had taken place? The racist sentiments in the book directed at any other ethnic group would create a nationwide uproar today. Yet, aimed at the Tur Turks, it seems to be acceptable. If this is not hypocrisy, double standards, I don't know what is. This book is a piece of propaganda, and Morgenthau is the source of many articles and stories. He is the principal supplier of information to Lord Bryce and Arnold Toynbee, who produced another book of lies known as the Blue Book that the Armenian lobby uses every day. Morgenthau is also the source of information to Johannes Lepsius, the German Protestant missionary suffering from Islamophobia. I cannot help but wonder how many of the young Armenians who turned 
to the terrorist assassinations of Turkish officials in the 1970s and 1980s were actually influenced by reading the provocative, bogus stories in Ambassador Morgenthau's story. Ambassador Morgenthau, by having a book of lies ghostwritten for him, vilifying an entire nation, had committed a crime of conscience, the repercussions of which can be still felt today. Will Ambassador Morgenthau's evil scheme finally be recognized for what it is? Will the fraud behind the blue book propaganda, Lepsi's photos, and others finally be exposed? Well, those are great discussions for future episodes. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.